Does being biblical run the risk of making you and me appear to be kind of Grinch-like at Christmas time? Uh, we're spending Christmas this year at Matthew's house, and this morning we're going to encounter Matthew's version of the visit of the wise men. Now, I absolutely uh, love our hand-carved olive wood nativity set that I brought back from the Holy Land in 1983, and it's a typical uh, stable scene, and the wise men, the three wise men, and their camels are there, and they're bowing down, and they're presenting gifts to the baby Jesus in the manger, and Mary and Joseph are there, and some shepherds and sheep, a couple of donkeys, and the star is kind of poised on the peak of the stable roof, except there's only a slight problem biblically with this scenario. The wise men were never at the manger, and there's no mention in the Bible of any animals being at stable, and the star is not there either in Scripture, and the Bible says nothing about the number of the wise men, it just says it's plural. So it could be two or 20. And the wise men never encounter Jesus in a stable. They encounter him in a house. And they never meet the baby Jesus. They, we're going to see in our text this morning, they, they meet the young child Jesus. And Matthew's very, very meticulous about what Greek words he uses, and he carefully chooses a word that literally means young child, not baby. And you're going to see in verse 1 of our text, there's the word after in the phrase after Jesus was born, that that word after probably refers to a period of time to two to three years after that first Christmas day. Ugh, I feel like a Grinch telling you all this on the Sunday before Christmas, but don't let it spoil your Christmas. Because the story of the wise men is really not about the wise men at all. They are not the main characters. So who are the main characters? Well, there's two of them. There's the one who lies, and there's the one who dies. Let's take a look. Turn with me in your Bibles and keep them open to Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter. We're looking this morning at verses 1 through 12. And let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word, that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now hear God's word addressed to you and me, beginning to read at verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the, summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them that at what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Please join me as 
we pray again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Right off in verse 1, Matthew introduces you and me to one of the main characters of this part of his Christmas story. And it's Herod. Herod the Great. Herod, who is king of the Jews. Now, we know very little at all about the wise men, but we know a heck of a lot about King Herod, Herod the Great. And we know with historical accuracy that he died in 4 B.C. That means if you and I do the math, and Jesus was born during the time of Herod, Jesus had to be born at or before 4 B.C. So our Advent calendars are more than likely off for about four years. And we know historically that Herod was one of, one of the most vile, despicable, cruel, ruthless, evil, pile up the adjectives, the negative ones, suspicious and paranoid person that has ever walked planet Earth. Herod majored in death by assassination. He had his own mother killed. He assassinated his wife, his three sons, just to make sure that they were never, ever even tempted to usurp his throne. He had them snuffed out, which caused Roman Emperor Augustus to say about Herod, it's safer to be Herod's pig than his son. So imagine what thoughts are going through bloodthirsty Herod, king of the Jews' mind, when he hears that's from wise men, from Persia. Astrologers who study the stars have arrived in Jerusalem, and they're going all around asking where the new king of the Jews has been born. They say that they've seen his star, and they've come to worship him. And Matthew, in a very understated way, says, Herod hears this, and now he is troubled. And all of Jerusalem, along with him, is troubled. They're troubled because they know that when, that when Herod hears this, he's liable to, to set out in a bloody rage, and who knows whose heads are going to roll. Back in 2012, the city of Indianapolis was really troubled. And so was its franchise quarterback, Peyton Manning. Because the owners of the Colts have announced that they are drafting Stanford quarterback Andrew Luck. Now, Peyton Manning was an icon of Indianapolis. He was king of the hill. He was a shoe-in for the Hall of Fame. But Peyton Manning was also a self-effacing, humble Presbyterian Christian. And Peyton realized that he was probably going to be displaced by this upstart rookie. And so Peyton asked to be released. And he was. And he wished Andrew luck. And then he was soon picked up by the Denver Broncos. And Peyton had the last laugh because he led the Broncos to the Super Bowl championship just this past year. But Herod, Herod the Great is no Peyton Manning. He gathers the scribes and the chief priests and asks them, where is this new king of the Jews supposed to be born? And they tell him, they quote Micah chapter 5 verse 2, they say he's to be born in Bethlehem. And so now Herod hatches his next assassination plot, and that's to bump off God in the flesh. He sends the wise men on a journey. It's only about five miles down the road to the town of Bethlehem. And he tells them a big, fat lie. He says, find this new king of the Jews and then come back and tell me the exact location because just like you guys, I want to come and worship him too. So here you've got Herod who lied. And the other main character of the story is Jesus, who dies. 
But not just yet. No, no, no. God warns the wise men in a dream to take the Jerusalem bypass on the way home and not go back via here. But anyway, the wise men set out on their journey to Bethlehem, and lo and behold, there's the star. There's the star that had arisen. You see, Herod thinks life is all about him. He is so egotistical, he believes that in the drama of life, he is the star of the show, and he will allow no one else to share his limelight. But there's another star in this drama. I don't think it's a star star. No, I think it's God's first century GPS, God's positional system. What I believe is happening here is a supernatural manifestation of God's Shekinah glory that arises in the sky, much like the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire that led the Israelites in the wilderness as they were escaping Egyptian slavery. Now, here's where I never cease to be amazed by the myopic, uh, rationalistic faith of some of my favorite Christian friends. If you read uh, Willie Barclay, the great Scottish pastor and Bible scholar, and read his commentary on Matthew, he says at this point that there's no need for you and I to think that this star actually moved and led the wise men to where Jesus was. That's probably just Matthew waxing poetic. Why not? Why not believe that that star, that Shekinah glory, whatever it was, really did guide them to where Jesus was? Earlier in this service, you and I stood and we boldly and confidently said, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Well, is he? He either is or he isn't. Two weeks ago, I said, if that phrase of the Apostles' Creed is true, And that really is the hardest to swallow phrase of the creed, my friends. I mean, if you can believe that phrase is true, then a virgin conception is a miracle that you and I shouldn't choke on, and neither would be this star, whatever it is. I believe that this star did move. I believe it guided the wise men to where Christ Jesus was. And my friends, the grace of God The grace of Almighty God is that he uses this star, this object, this thing, whatever it is, something that astrologers like these pagan wise men erroneously and blasphemously idolize and worship, he uses that to actually lead them to the one who is not just the new king of the Jews, but king of kings and lord of lords, not just to one who is found under a star, but the one who is the bright and morning star, the one who dies, who dies in order, to be the, in order to be the savior of the world, to save even these wise men and anyone else who's as wise as they are and fall to their knees and worship him when they come to a face-to-face encounter with the living Christ. My friends, when you and I meet Jesus at more than second hand, everything is always and forever changed. And I believe these wise men leave Bethlehem a whole lot wiser than when they arrived. I don't think it's reading into the text to say that when they leave Bethlehem, they do so as twice born. You know, they'd spent their whole lives, their whole adult lives anyway, really believing that one's destiny is is influenced and finally settled by what star you're born under. But now they leave Bethlehem, realizing that it doesn't matter a lick what star you're born under, but how many times you've been born. And I believe those wise men leave Bethlehem as born-again followers of Jesus Christ. And I don't think it's reading into the text to say that most likely they become the very first missionaries of the gospel, taking the gospel of, of grace, of the newborn King of kings and Lord of lords, taking it to where they came from, 
Because we know for a fact that in the area of Iran and Iraq, the Christian faith has been there since the first century. So how did it get there? Could it be that these wise men now become really wise, took it there when they went home on the Jerusalem bypass, warned in a dream by God to bypass Herod, and they take the gospel home. Herod lies. Jesus dies. Those are the two main characters. And that leaves you and me on this Sunday before Christmas with this question to wrestle with. Will we bypass Herod on the journey home? You see, Herod is all about death, and Jesus is all about life. And Herod is all about lies, and Jesus is all about the truth. In fact, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Herod is all around us. You and I live amidst a culture of death. Two-thirds of Americans now approve of euthanasia. 75% of non-Christians say abortion is okay. More and more, the elderly are being disrespected and marginalized. Increasingly, you and I are being encouraged to look at the poor as perhaps something less, something subhuman. The sexual revolution of the last 40 years has cheapened life and set in motion a pandemic of disease and death that has wrecked the lives of millions, if not billions of people around the world. We live amidst a culture of death. It's the wise man, the wise woman, the wise boy or girl who understands that Herod is all about lies and death. And Jesus, the one who dies, ironically, paradoxically, is all about life and truth. Will you and I bypass, take the Jerusalem bypass and bypass Herod? How do we do that? By standing for life. This church stands for life. It stands for ministry to the poor and the disenfranchised. That's why we spun off CAM and SAM Ministries and the Christian Medical and Dental Clinics. That's why we support Habitat for Humanity and World Vision around the world. That's why we send mission teams, this medical mission team, to Mexico. That's why we're delighted that Presbyterians Pro-Life meets every month in our building. We stand for life. Some of us will gather in this sanctuary on Thursday for the funeral of Martha Siv. What could be more out of place than a funeral three days before Christmas? Amidst all the festivity and joy and bright lights, a funeral. What a downer. Oh, it's just awkward. It shouldn't be happening right before Christmas unless you're wise enough to understand that that's exactly where it belongs. And this funeral on Thursday is going to be sandwiched in great beauty because about two and a half weeks ago, Martha's Formerly Buddhist husband, Sashan, came to Christ. Two weeks ago today, he was baptized. We marked his eternal life in Christ at that font. That sandwich is one side of her funeral, and she got to see that baptism before she died, and it's sandwiched on the other side by Christmas Day, which is not about cards and presents and lights and carols. It's about the fact that God came into time and space to be the very death of death itself, to break the bondage of Herod's culture upon you and me today and all our days. My friends, that is the truth of the Christmas gospel. 
And because that gospel is true, you and I can look each other in the eye this morning, and I'm going to ask you to do that in just a moment, to look to the person to your right and to your left, the one behind you and in front of you. Look them in the eye with a smile on your face. Say Merry Christmas. Do it right now. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Merry Christmas.